On the 3rd of March 1974, Turkish Airlines Flight 981, a fully loaded McDonnell Douglas DC-10 airliner, crashed minutes after the takeoff from Orly Airport, Paris. All 346 people on board were killed, and at the time it was the worst air crash on record. It later transpired that another DC-10 had suffered an identical accident just two years earlier, but had managed to land without serious incident. However, warnings went unheeded, and two years later the flight of Turkish Airlines 981 would end in death and disaster. During the late 1960s, three airline manufacturers were in competition to dominate the booming air travel market – Boeing, Lockheed and McDonnell Douglas. While Boeing looked set to be the leader of the pack with the iconic 747 already in the air, McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed were scrambling for second place, both looking to produce a mid-sized jet to fulfil the proposal from American Airlines for a three to four hundred seater which could take off from regular runways. Lockheed announced it was building the L1011 TriStar to fulfil this demand, and in response McDonnell Douglas announced that it would be launched in the DC-10. McDonnell Douglas, suffering financial problems and desperate to stave off bankruptcy, declared that the DC-10 would beat Lockheed's TriStar to market, and it would be a better plane to boot. McDonnell Douglas lived up to their claim, and the first DC-10s were put into service in August of 1970, almost two years ahead of Lockheed. However, in the rush to be the first company to get their planes airborne, had McDonnell Douglas compromised on safety. On March 3, 1974, Turkish Airlines Flight 981 from Istanbul touched down safely at Paris's Orly Airport, making a brief stop before continuing on to its final destination of London. Orly Airport was in a state of chaos that day, as British BEA workers had gone on strike, causing massive disruption and passenger delays all across Europe. Stranded passengers were being reseated on any available flight back to London. Flight 981 was mostly empty after the Paris stop, and in a terrible twist of fate, took on an extra 215 passengers who would normally have been travelling back on other planes. After a short delay boarding the extra passengers, Flight 981 took off just after midday for the short one hour flight to London. The first few minutes of the flight were uneventful, and the plane climbed normally, heading towards its cruising altitude of 23,000 feet. Suddenly, as the plane reached around 12,000 feet, it was rocked by a violent explosion. The rearmost two rows of seats were sucked straight through the cabin floor, and the six passengers sitting there were blown out through a hole in the side of the fuselage. The pilots, Captain Nijat Berkots and First Officer Oral Ulsman, had no idea what had just happened in the back of the passenger cabin, but what they did know was that the airliner was suddenly out of control, diving towards the ground. The desperate struggle to control the falling plane was captured on the cockpit voice recorder. Berkoz. What happened? Ullusman, the cabin blew out. Berkoz, are you sure? The plane yawed violently to the left and began diving steeply. The plane is diving so fast that the airspeed warning begins to sound. The plane will start to break up in midair if it goes much faster. Berkots, bring it up. Pull her nose up. Bullusman, I can't bring it up. She's not responding. Nothing is left. 7,000 feet. Berkos, it looks like we're going to hit the ground. Speed. The plane is now going so fast that the nose begins to lift of its own accord. Hence the cry of speed from Captain Burkots. Ullsman powered the engines in a last-ditch effort to gain altitude, but it was no use. In the final few moments, there's only silence as the pilots desperately try to pull up the nose of the doomed airliner. At 12.41pm, just 70 seconds after the explosion, Flight 981 ploughs into the trees of the Ermenonville Forest at nearly 800 kilometres an hour. Smashing through the forest for almost a kilometre, the plane and everybody on board disintegrate into thousands of fragments. All 346 people are killed instantly. Emergency services rushed to the scene, but it was immediately apparent that this was not a rescue operation. The plane, its passengers and cargo were scattered over 65,000 square metres, 
torn into thousands of unrecognisable pieces. Only the engines, an odd wheel and a small part of the fuselage remained identifiable as having come from an aircraft. Of the passengers, only 20 victims were able to be identified as intact bodies by the rescue services. The macabre clean-up process began. Hundreds of thousands of plane fragments and an estimated 20,000 body parts are collected by the rescue service personnel and volunteers. A very grim task indeed. It's quickly established that not all of the wreckage is in the Ermanville forest. The rear cargo door, some luggage, and the rear two rows of seats containing six victims are found some 15 kilometres away in a field outside a village called St. Pathus. The initial cause for the crash had been discovered. The rear cargo door lock had failed, resulting in an explosive decompression in the cargo bay. This in turn collapsed the cabin floor above, dragging the seats and the six passengers down and out through the wide open cargo door. But why had this caused the plane to crash? The plane was still intact with engine power and it had a functioning crew. The reason was that the control cables to the rear tail rudder, the rear engine and flaps all ran through the floor where the rear seats were located. As these seats were torn through the floor, the control cables were severed. From that point on, the pitch of the plane became impossible to control and all aboard were doomed. It was a series of events that could lead to a total loss of an aircraft and what made it worse was that McDonnell Douglas knew all about this problem and instead of fixing it, had tried to skirt around it to save costs and reputation. During the design phase, the DC-10 had been given an outward opening rear cargo door in order to maximise space for cargo inside. And the problem with outward opening doors is that the pressure inside the aircraft works against them. The higher the plane goes, the more pressure is exerted against the door, trying to force it open. They need a very secure locking mechanism to prevent an explosive blowout. And he could make a whole video about the door lock mechanism and why it failed, but suffice to say that the overly complex design they came up with was not only likely to fail under certain conditions, but it also had a problem that the door could appear to be locked and safe when in fact it wasn't. It was possible to have a situation where the lock had not fully engaged, and yet there was no warning light on in the cockpit, and the baggage handler who closed the door from the outside would have no idea that the door wasn't locked properly either. Nobody would know until it was too late. This potential to lose the whole aircraft had shown itself during ground testing back in 1970, when the aft cargo door blew out, collapsing the floor and severing the control cables to the tail. Now instead of rectifying this potentially fatal flaw, McDonnell Douglas simply blamed human error. They insisted that the door hadn't been closed properly by the test operator. However, the obvious and deadly design flaw was just ignored, as it would cause too much delay and cost to undertake a redesign. Then, in 1972, a DC-10 flying out of Detroit suffered explosive decompression as the rear cargo door blew out at 12,000 feet. In an almost identical series of events, the rear cabin floor collapsed and the plane lost control and began to dive. Luckily, for the 67 people on board, the exceptional skill of the captain and the first officer in using the engines to steer allowed for a very risky emergency landing. A fatal crash had been narrowly averted, and importantly, the NTSB investigators had a clear picture of what happened and what was needed to fix the problem. The NTSB report recommended urgent modifications to the cargo door locking mechanism and additional venting inside the cabin to prevent the floor collapse. Unbelievably, the FAA didn't mandate these changes, but instead relied on a promise from McDonnell Douglas that they would deal with this in-house and in their own time. Now, McDonnell Douglas did send out some service advisory bulletins asking airlines to make the modifications to the door lock, but in reality, not much changed. Some DC-10s continued to fly with the same fatal design flaw. The plane involved in the Ermenonville disaster was fuselage number 29. This was one of six DC-10s sold to Turkish Airlines in late 1972. The cargo door modifications had not been undertaken on this plane, 
Somehow, the missing work had been signed off by McDonnell Douglas inspectors as completed. In the rush to get the planes in service for the Christmas period, corners were cut. The handover from the McDonnell Douglas engineers to their Turkish counterparts was rushed and chaotic. There was language confusion, missing service manuals, poor maintenance facilities, they all made for a rough handover. Somewhere in all this confusion, somebody accidentally bent the locking rod on the aft cargo door, and then added metal shims to the switch contacts on the door, so that the warning light in the cockpit would turn off after the door was shut, even if it wasn't closed properly. A poor design had just been made so much worse. It's incredible that Turkish Airlines managed to fly this plane for 15 months with this jury-rigged cargo door, but any luck they had had ran out for 346 people on March 3rd, 1974, in the skies outside of Paris. In the initial aftermath after the crash, McDonnell Douglas again tried to blame human error for the cause, insisting that the baggage handler at Orly Airport must have been to blame. However, the FAA's failure to implement the NTSB recommendations soon came to light, and the press covering the disaster made sure that all these failings came to the public's attention. Pretty soon, the idea of safety concerns being brushed off to save reputation and money, shady backroom deals and gentlemen's agreements had become fixed in the mind of the public. The expose of a memo showing McDonnell Douglas were well aware of the potential for a major catastrophe due to the cabin floor design, then put this whole saga into the realm of criminal negligence. McDonnell Douglas faced multiple lawsuits from families of the victims in the largest ever action filed against a civil aviation company. After attempting to blame everyone but themselves, McDonnell Douglas finally settled out of court for a sum equivalent to about $500 million in today's value. The NTSB recommendations were finally mandated by the FAA, and the aft cargo door design flaw was finally fixed. Although this would not be the last crash involving a DC-10, never again would people die due to the failure of the rear cargo door. During the research of this topic, it became clear to me that it's impossible to lay the blame for this terrible accident at the door of just one person or one single company, because there were failings all along from all sides. The FAA officials who refused to mandate the changes, the airline executives who, in a bid to save their company, ignored the dangerous design flaw exposed during ground testing, the people responsible for jury rigging the cargo door, the original aircraft design, the fuselage builders who knew that the rear cabin floor was dangerous, the inspectors who signed off on the work which never had been done. All of these factors came into play on that fateful day, 12,000 feet above the outskirts of Paris. There is a memorial to the victims of Flight 981, accessible on foot, deep inside the Ermenonville forest. It's often visited by the families of the victims of the tragedy. Even today, people walking in the forest are still finding fragments of the doomed airliner in the undergrowth, tiny reminders of the tragedy that took place here all those years ago. To some extent, the physical and mental scars of the disaster still remain today, and probably will for years to come. <laughs>